Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Opportunity. I think for young people that the most important thing that you will do in your youth, frankly, is figure out what it is you want to be when you grow up. And I think the only way you're really going to be able to do that successfully is if you have lots and lots and lots of experiences with different kinds of jobs, not all of which you will love. And that's okay because that's part of the process. But I think from the time you are young, 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 that hopefully your parents are giving you chores to do at home, you're finding things to do within your neighborhood, within the family, the things that you can do well, that you can contribute to the family. The first work experiences we ever do in our lives are typically within the family, where you're doing chores, your parents are expecting you to do certain things, to pick up after yourself, to make your bed, to help out at home, to actually set the table, clear the table, maybe do the dishes in the evening, that the challenge is going to be that others will not expect you to do chores like your sighted siblings do or your, your friends at school. But you've got to advocate for yourself and say, I can do this, I want to do it, and participate, first at home, then in the neighborhood, and then in the larger community. I've got a couple of things that I want to share with all the young people watching this video. Number one is, you are a perfectly capable human being. You simply have a vision impairment, or maybe you have a vision impairment and another disability, but you're still able to do things. And I think that what happens a lot of times when you are the person with a disability is that the people around you, mostly adults, but also some of the kids, are gonna do things for you and do things for you and do things for you. They're gonna bring you things and take you places and let you cut into the line. People are gonna give you things sometimes just because you're blind and you don't need them to do that, frankly. You need to get out there and do some volunteer work probably pretty early on. I would say no later than by the time you're 10. 10, 11 years old is perfect time to get out there and really start doing some things for other people. Why? Two reasons. One, it lets other people know that you want to help others, that you don't just expect people to help you, but that you have something to give back to the community, that you want to help other people in the community because you are able. And then the second reason, which is equally important, maybe even more important in some ways, is because you have a vision impairment, you're blind or you have low vision, it may be difficult when you first start going out there to try to get paid employment to find a, an employer that's willing to give you a chance. Employers need evidence and volunteerism gives you that evidence that you can do a job and do it consistently, do it well, even without the benefit of pay. It is more important than almost anything else you're gonna do in life is to go out there and get those work experiences because everybody has to go to school. That's a mandated thing. You, you don't have a choice. You have to go to school. You have to do your studies. But not everybody has to go out and get a job or do volunteer work when they're young. And I think what you just said then, team player, that's the, the side benefit of participating in these sorts of volunteering those sorts of activities because you're developing all those soft skills that we talk about that are necessary for employability and the best way to get those is to practice them in a real life mm -hmm. situation where you are having a responsibility to be part of a team or to put yourself out there and have to advocate for someone giving you a go. It's important to do these things before you have to make the rent and before yeah. you have to put food on the table and before yeah. you have to be the one who's fully responsible for for making all those kinds of payments, to do it while you're still at home and while you're in school is a really safe environment because you have mom and dad taking care of the house in terms of you know putting a roof over your head and 
and putting food on the table, it's, it's not so pressurized. Whereas if you suddenly have to get a job because you have to pay the rent, the pressure is on. And so I think the volunteering is, it's safer, it's more comfortable in that regard, but it's important to remember, if you're doing a volunteer job, you have to treat it just like work. Be there, be there on time, do the job that they ask you to do, don't complain. All the things that are applicable to work are applicable to volunteer activity. Uh, students might have an opportunity, usually when they're in year 10, to do a week of formal work experience. But what's your advice around doing that work experience placement? If you're in grade 10, you're probably starting to think about mm, maybe I'd like to be an OT or maybe I'd like to be a teacher or maybe I'd like to be an astronaut or maybe I'd like to work in a bank or maybe I'd like to uh, be a personal trainer and do fitness courses with people or maybe I'd like to be an actress or a singer. It doesn't matter. It's just you, you're starting to think what would I like to do when I grow up, when I leave school, when I finish with all of this school thing what would I like to be doing? Make sure that your work experience fits with what you're thinking about. It doesn't have to be the exact job. It probably won't be because that's tricky. But it should be related. But it's also a wonderful opportunity if you play your cards right to demonstrate skills. So if I have gotten myself organized and I do know my route and I do know what tools I might need on the job, if I know what the dress code is, if I've done some research into the company, if I can impress the people at that work site for that week that I'm on the ball, that I've paid attention, that I'm well prepared, and that I'm taking away the maximum amount of information available to me from that work experience, they're going to be thinking positively about you into the future and might be willing to give you another shot say during the summer holidays or the Christmas holidays or even after you finish school. It's important to pay attention to the fact that no matter how short that work experience is, for you it's an opportunity to demonstrate skills. It's also a really wonderful opportunity for other people to see what you can do, to see you demonstrate your competencies, to show other people that as a blind or low vision person, you are more like them than different, that you can work, that you want to work, and that you can contribute to the larger community. What's a strategy for increasing your database of knowing what jobs exist? Good, good question, Natalie. I think that the best way for young people who are blind or have low vision to just get general information about what's out there is to ask a series of questions. To ask all of the adults that you encounter in your life, not just what do they do and what do they like about what they do and what do they not like about what they do, but what other kinds of jobs are related to the job that they're doing. There's all kinds of jobs that you can find out about, but you have to ask the question. Not just what are you doing, but how, who else works where you're working? What are the other kinds of jobs in that environment? And what would they be called? You can go online and start reading about it, investigating it. You can find out what the statistics are about how many of those kind of workers there are out there, particularly in your community. When I think about that and that whole business of kind of interviewing workers. It makes me think about informational interviewing, which is a technique that we use when we go out and we find a place where we're really interested in working. We maybe even have a job, an idea in mind of a career path that we think we might enjoy. That's a great time to come back home, sit down, write out all the questions you would like to ask someone actually doing that job. But if you call someone up and say, you know, I'm really interested in coming in and just chatting with you about becoming an OT, for example. Could I have 15, 20 minutes of your time to just sit and visit about what it takes to be an OT? What kind of training I would need? 
what kind of work experiences would benefit me, where I might want to study, the kinds of courses I might want to take in high school that are related to that. I can find out more from you about being an OT, because you are one, than I can from any book or any reading that I do online. The real person. And then, if I'm really, really interested and I think, oh, Nat's an OT, I want to be an OT. I really like the way this sounds. It makes good sense for me. I'm that kind of a personality. I like that kind of work. But, you know, Nat's got vision and I don't know, maybe I couldn't do that job. Then you have to start searching to see if you can find yourself an OT without vision or an OT with um, low vision so that you can say, now, wait a minute. I've interviewed someone who has vision who's doing this job. Now let me interview someone who doesn't have good vision and find out what's different, what tools that OT with no vision or limited vision is using in order to be able to do that job. One last thing, it's the third thing I want to mention on this point. I've done a lot of research in my day and I've read a lot of research and one of the things I found most interesting when I was reading about the difference between sighted job seekers and blind and low vision job seekers in terms of how they go out and look for work. The biggest difference is that blind and low vision people tend to have smaller networks than sighted people. They don't know as many people. They don't know as many people who know people who know people who know people who know people. They have smaller networks. And the problem with that, if you are the one looking for a job, is that your choices are restricted by the size of your network. And that's part of what you need to be thinking about as a blind or low vision job seeker in the future. You need a bigger net so that you can get more leads, that you can get more opportunities to come to fruition for you. You write down the names of the people you interview. You write down when you interviewed and where you interviewed and what you learned and what you liked and what you didn't like. And you file it away in a retrievable system that enables you, when you're ready to go look for work, to come back to those contacts and incorporate those contacts into your personal network. And it's at that juncture, maybe two, three years down the road, where you finished your credentialing, you finished all of the work, except getting the job, that you can come back to someone like Natalie, or someone like Laura, or someone like me and say, do you remember when we did this informational interview and I met you and, you, and I've done the things you suggested, I went and did that, and now I'm ready to go for work. So what do you think? Have you got any ideas for me, any leads for me? Who else could you tell? You have to work that network so that it will work for you.